I was uh, wandering around town today and I saw that marquee out there, John Bradshaw on divorce. And uh, I was thinking of what, uh, you know, what an anomaly that would have been 150 years ago. Uh, because 150 years ago, as far as I've been able to ascertain looking at history books, uh, divorce was really something quite unusual. And uh, families were bonded together out of uh, survival needs. Uh, they were enmeshed and networked together more out of survival needs, out of economic needs. And there is uh, some evidence that the teachings and the, uh, the, the sort of support that the religious community has given for the indisability of marriage has come out of what was really a very practical thing, the, the issues around survival, people banding together with very defined roles and very much needing each other. So there were, there were economic reasons 150 years ago why divorce was not prevalent. There were also uh, demographic reasons 150 years ago why divorce was not prevalent. Uh, people didn't live uh, as long. The average marriage was about 15 years. And as much divorce as we have, like 50% to 60% of the marriages end in divorce, um, our average marriages are 25 years. Now that's a long time to sit across the table from somebody. And, uh, you know, there, there is no question that longevity has been a major factor in, in bringing pressure on marriages. The other thing that has happened is the Industrial Revolution, where fathers have been taken out of the family there, there was a time 150 years ago where boys bonded with their fathers out of work apprenticeship systems. There was a, a living side by side watching their fathers do extraordinary things like, you know, build houses and make shoes and uh, there was a bonding that took place. I, I've been giving lectures on, on the search for the lost father. Sherry Hyde did a study of 7,291 men and not one of them had a close relationship with their father. So there's no question that the moving of the father out of the family, and in many ways the father has been lost in modern times through wars and through the dehumanization of work. There are lots and lots of factors that have impacted the family so that now we're in a context where also the Industrial Revolution has brought more leisure, more freedom, and therefore has focused emotional intimacy in a way that would be unheard of 150 years ago or 200 years ago. If some of you uh, saw the series I did on the family, the book I wrote about the family, I talk about the poisonous pedagogy, the rules that are 200 years out of date. That those rules come from the time of kings. They worked back then. They worked back then. And see, we wonder, people want to go back to old rules, but they don't understand that the, the whole socio, socioeconomic culture has changed. So that today, if we're going to have families bonded together, they have to be bonded on the basis of emotional intimacy. And that's what we don't know anything about. We're, we're like emotional primitives. You know, we can put people on the moon, but we don't know how to look somebody in the eyes and share feelings with them. And be tender and be vulnerable and let, let each other in on our inner environments. Because we've had no modeling for that. In fact, most of us have been raised in traditions that said feelings are weak. So we have an enormous problem that has surfaced the high divorce rate and the impact on the lives of people, uh, the children. I'm a child from a divorced family. I can remember lying in bed at night, crying my eyes out, wondering where my daddy was. 
I, I'm a, an adult child of an alcoholic family. Uh, it was very, very painful for me, the loss of my family. But it was also terribly painful for my mother and father. And so when we come to look at divorce, we've got to understand that it's, that it's become a fact of modern life. I can remember my son coming home from school and 90% of the kids he was running around with were from divorced families. So we have to accept that divorce has become a fact of life. And I know that a lot of the religious people are going to throw their sweaty nightcaps in the air and say, you know, uh, but we've got to accept it. That it's a fact of modern life. It may be that we're moving toward a time where serial monogamy is going to be the new form of marriage. I don't know what that's going to mean for the family, but, but the fact is that divorce is a fact of modern life. It's an enormous factor. And, and you know, I preach in our center in Houston, the Center for Recovering Families, we see families that stay together for the children. We see all kinds of catastrophes coming out of that. All kinds of cross-generational bonding and emotional incest getting set up where boys become mom's little man and girls become daddy's little princess, where mom and dad aren't making the marriage so they triangulate the children. Uh, it, it's not a fact that it's the best thing to stay together for the children. So there's a lot of complicated issues that we're really beginning to understand now. Divorce is a very, very devastating thing for the people involved, the families involved. And I don't want to treat it lightly. In fact, what I want to talk about is that pe most people, for many people, divorce is a waste of time. Because they go through all this suffering and pain. They go through all the suffering and pain, but they don't really divorce. Uh, or they don't do the work that you have to do to survive divorce. What I'm going to be focusing on this evening really surviving the divorce. That is, coming out of it whole and healthy and, and, and using it as an occasion for growth and really divorcing. Many people that we see in therapy don't divorce well. I mean, if you're going to divorce, you need to divorce well. Like, like I see people, they're eight, you know, eight years divorced and they're still having the same fights. They're still having, well, why divorce if you're going to have the same fights? You know, they're still beating up on each other. Well, what was the point of getting a divorce? They're still getting even with each other. They're still resenting each other. So, so that, that's not very useful. Uh, so, so what we're going to talk about, divorce is number two on, on the stress scale. You know, they, they give you these stress tests and 100 is the death of a spouse and 75 is the divorce. See, I think it's just the opposite myself. I think divorce is a hundred. Because what I've seen, I've seen people do their grief work who, who are widowed. I mean, it's clear the person is dead and, and, and there's, not, there's no ambivalence about that. But when you're divorcing somebody, they're not dead. And if you have children, then there's that connection to the children. And... Uh, uh, again, as we look at this material tonight, another factor that's got to be taken into consideration is what are the unresolved issues in both persons' life? We do a lot of work in our center uh, with adult children or what we call codependency or what we call people who never got their childhood developmental needs met. So you have adults running around with a little child inside of them and then we, we fall in love with each other because, and the two kids just symbiotically bond. See, and that in love is sort of nature's dirty trick. Because nature wants babies. Uh, and there's all this erotic stuff that goes within love. It, you hyperventilate. And uh, you go back into the big bang uh, sexually. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're one with the cosmic dust. And you think it's going to last. And uh, it doesn't. It doesn't because in love is a biological bonding phenomenon. It, it's sort of nature's dirty trick. Nature wants babies. Uh, and if you come from a dysfunctional family, which everybody does, in my opinion, to some degree, 
Now, no families are totally dysfunctional, but, but no families are totally functional, in my opinion. Uh, so, so depending on the level of dysfunctionality, those two kids bond together, but basically what those two kids are saying to each other is, look, when we get married, you be the mother that I never had. And her little girl is saying, when we get married, you be the daddy that I never had. So what often happens then is there's this investment of esteem. And that's, that's the kind of thing we see where someone's suicidal when they start getting the divorce. You, you see this overinvestment. It's a child. It's a child's investment in a parent. You don't get suicidal as an adult breaking a relationship. Yes, it's sad and it's painful and there's all kinds of issues around it. But to be suicidal over it? You see, so what we've got to be, be aware of is that when I talk about surviving divorce and going through the divorce process, there's other issues there that may be unfinished business from childhood. Abandonment issues. That place where it feels like somebody's nailed a spike in the middle of your chest. That's almost always partly the abandonment issues from childhood that are coming out as this person is leaving, as we have reenacted the family drama and invested in them. So what I thought I would do tonight is I would take the letters of the word surviving. I like to use these little mnemonic formulas. So uh, the S, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about various characteristics of surviving. What I mean by that is, is, is getting through a divorce and coming out on the other side with some modicum of health. And probably the first thing that we've all got to do is we've got to stop denying. Now, there's denial that's always involved in this process. Uh, denial is an ego defense. It's not a river in Egypt. It's a joke. Uh, denial is a... I just want to see if you're awake. Uh, uh, denial is, uh, is an ego defense. It's like when reality becomes intolerable and painful, denial comes in. A fantasy, a, like a mirage in the desert. A child, children will make their parents wonderful, even if they're not, because they need them to be wonderful. They need their parents to be wonderful. So anybody going through a divorce is going to be in pain. I don't care if you hated them. There's going to be pain about the separation. about Because this is somebody you once loved. You were in love with. You got married to. And, and what will happen is there's all, all kinds of forms of denial. Like minimizing. I see men do this perhaps more than women. Because women have been given more permission to have feelings. But minimizing. Dissociating. Uh, minimizing, trivializing, analyzing, intellectualizing, instead of what I'm going to suggest to you, that in order to survive divorce well, you've got to feel the feelings. You've got to go into the pain. You've got to do the legitimate suffering. Remember Carl Jung said, all neurosis is a substitute for legitimate suffering. And there is legitimate suffering here. And there's no way around it. We're going to have to do it if we're going to survive and get to the other side. Now, the, so the denying can be that you deny the impact of it in your life. You deny your feelings about it. You deny the seriousness of it. You deny, uh, you know, what's really happening to you about it. Uh, you minimize it. You analyze it. You rationalize it. You dissociate from it. Or as I'm going to talk about later, you find ways to distract yourself so you don't have to feel. The second thing, uh, the you, the you is understanding, understanding, understanding the grief process. And this is what I call a cognitive, ma ma uh, a cognitive uh, life raft. Uh, you need to understand grief, that what you're going through when you divorce is grieving. And that grief is a very elaborate process. Freud wrote a paper called Mourning and Melancholia 
which was a description of a woman who went through what were called involutional depressions every year at a certain time. And what he found is that her mother had died during this period, about nine years earlier, but she had never done the grief work. What he came to call the grief work. That there is literally a work that the psyche has to do in order to decathect, in order to let go of that beloved object, that person that you were involved with. So understanding grief is to really understand a very complicated process. Later on in 1944, Eric Lindemann wrote a famous paper as a result of the Coconut Grove fire where a lot of people had been killed and there were these people, these survivors in the hospital. And Lindemann was a psychiatrist and his team was called in because there were people who had been hurt about the same to the same degree and some were getting well and some weren't. So they went in there and they started analyzing the people who were getting well. Their burdens were healing. They were doing the grief work. They were doing the grief work. The ones who weren't getting well were in denial. They were, they were denying, they were talking about other things, they were still talking about their loved ones as if they were alive. They weren't facing the pain and the heartache of the grief work. Now grief always starts with shock. By, you know, somebody came to you and said that a friend of yours that you loved, that you just saw yesterday had died. First thing you say is no. Oh no. No, not Joe. Oh, you gotta be kidding. See, denial, shock, denial, and then a kind of minimizing, kind of a bargaining goes on. Uh, when we do work with family of origin, where we really try to help people see, make the abuse real that they've gone through, because you can't heal what you can't feel. And if you're in denial about it, you can't heal it. So we try to help people to experience it, and experience the feelings of it, because you can only heal what you can feel. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but it's just amazing, they'll get it, you know, like, yeah, that's right, uh, you know, that, that really wasn't good that my daddy used to dunk my face in the toilet. I mean, literally, I had a guy telling me that his dad occasionally knocked him around, but they deserved it. And what I found out is the father was, would, would urinate and put their face in the toilet. Now, now that's denial, and I know that's gross, but it's, I, I want you to get the force of what denial is. Uh, denial is the woman telling me about her minister father, now, the woman whose husband's having all these affairs, and I say, well, did your father run around on you? And, oh, no, no, my father was this wonderful person. Uh, he was a minister, and, and he was one of the most kind, charitable men you'll ever meet. Like, he used to have this apartment house, and he would take women and put them in, give them apartments. Uh, he prostitutes. And he would visit them two and three times a week and give them presents. So you're not buying this. <laughs> this is denial. We don't want to look at it, what, what's called the shared focus and the shared denial. We don't look at, see, we don't look that the Empress has no clothes on. That's the shared denial. Every organization has a shared denial. There will be something that we're taught to focus on and not to look at. So the grief process goes through shock, bargaining, and you will see people, they'll get it, and then they're on their way home, and they'll start saying, well, my family wasn't that bad. See, bargaining, minimizing, it wasn't that bad. Well, it wasn't as bad as James. See, see but, but what you're doing is you're denying how bad it was for you. And what you got to get is that I'm in pain. See, I, I want to stop denying that I'm in pain. And, and then there's, there's usually a sense of anger that will come. And, and then there's remorse that often comes. The R is remorse. And, and the if only, and, and especially if you're the one that didn't initiate the divorce. If only, what did I do wrong? Well, if I had been a better lover, if I had been more kind, if I had been a better husband, if I had been a better breadwinner, if only, 
You know, maybe we really didn't try hard enough. Or maybe we really didn't do enough therapy. See, and that's part of the grief process. Remorse is part of the grief process. It's a kind of guilt where, where we, we wonder, you know, and, and, and it's part of, uh, you know, when someone dies, you, you will start thinking, well, gosh, I could have spent more time. Remember when my dad died, you know, I thought of all the times I could have spent time with him, especially in those last days. See, so remorse is part of the grief process. Anger, remorse, then usually uh, a kind of isolation and aloneness or sadness or hurt. And, and then, then it'll bounce back and forth, fear, anxiety. I'm going to come to that in just a minute. And then finally, when the grief work has been done, and it takes a long time to do it, don't think that you can do this work quickly because you can't. And the psyche has its own timetable on this one. You see, and somebody can come up and say, are you still worrying about your ex? Well, don't let anybody do that to you because you have your own pace. It depends on the voltage of your relationship. And you see, in grieving, we have to grieve the in-love times we had together, the good times. Uh, we have to grieve the dreams that didn't get fulfilled. We have to dream, uh, grieve the lost, you know, the, the, the expectations that didn't get met. You have to grieve all that. So, so there's a lot that has to be done that isn't often totally conscious. Now, the V in surviving is that you've got to value yourself because in our society, there is a lot of shame around divorce. And if you come out of certain religious traditions that have preached the, that marriage is forever and that or you come out of a family system where you've got messages in the system that no one in this family is ever divorced. You know, you may have heard that from the time you were a little bitty kid. You know, there's we, never been a divorce in this family, and so there you are. And you're in all this pain. You're in all this grief and pain. So there's a real ten temptation to say, I am a bad person. I have failed. I have failed to see ending a marriage as a failure. Now we've got to correct that. Because so often when I see two people coming to this point and I look at their family histories and I've probably dealt with 800 uh, therapies of marriages and probably 250 people going through divorces. Uh, when we look at their family histories, we wonder how they got as far as they did. I mean, time and time again, these people almost didn't have a chance. When you look at all the background and you look at the modeling that they're coming out of, and that nobody ever taught them any skills that, that we would call intimacy skills. Remember, intimacy is something that has to be learned. And most, you know, if you, if you were lucky enough to come from a functional family where a mom and dad were modeling intimacy, then you saw it. But the only model you had of a family, of a marriage, of a man and a woman being intimate was your mom and dad. Now that's not to blame mom and dad, but it's just to say that probably the most dominant characteristic of modern life is this emotional primitiveness that we have intimacy dysfunction. Some of you who are into codependency and working on your codependency, Another way to define codependency is intimacy dysfunction. Another way to define addiction is intimacy dysfunction. And addiction is a pathological relationship to a mood-altering experience that has life-damaging consequences. So it's a relationship. I know people who go to bed with their food. They go to bed with their food. They have a love affair with their food. Uh, when I was a drinking alcoholic, I went to bed with my bottle sometimes. With my pills there. They were my best friend. They were my relationship. See, so intimacy, dysfunction, 
And, and remember, we're dealing with a culture that has 75 million people's lives seriously affected by alcoholism. That's a Betty Ford statistic. 60 million, 60 million incest survivors, sexual abuse survivors. Half the population in eating disorders. 15 million violent families, and we think it's higher than that. Violence doesn't get reported very often. I'm going to bet incest is higher than the, the stats. And the stats currently that are being quoted by a lot of treatment centers are one out of four women by age 13 will be abused by somebody over 18. And 80% know they're offenders. We've got severe uh, intimacy dysfunction in our society. So, so, so the, the, the stats on divorce are telling us that there's a lot of what I would call innocence in this. People doing the best they have known how to do. And so when you value yourself, you've got to say, I've made the best decision available to me. I did the best I could with the knowledge that I had. I did the best I could. I mean, if we took a picture of a courtship, you know, a happy day in Santa Fe while you were in love. And then we went over here and hit the divorce court. You know, when you're getting the red Christmas tree ornaments and he's getting the greens. <laughs> now, if you saw those two things on a split screen, I mean, that's a pretty heavy trip. What has happened from there to there? And if you don't think this isn't a big legal contract here, you go to a divorce court. And, and you see, the front end isn't quite like the back end. I mean, unfortunately, we've got a very bad contract on the front end of marriage. Do you take this man, Peter Lothwa, up for better or for sickness and out till death do you part? It doesn't say who's going to take the garbage out. Who's going to fix the commodes when they're running over? That isn't in the contract. They look at me in my house, I say, hey, it's not in the contract. <laughs> Who's going to take the garbage out? All that kind of stuff isn't in the contract. But you go to a divorce court and watch what is in the contract. Man, it's all spelled out. So you see, there's some real romanticized notions of marriage and unrealistic expectations of marriage. That people are going to sit across from each other for 25 years and never have wandering eyes and, and never have other fantasies. And, I mean, some of that stuff is totally unrealistic. And, uh, and I'm not saying that, that we should endorse somebody acting out in a marriage. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there's going to be conflict. And the best studies that have been done on relationships, they have conflict. Susan Campbell did this study at Berkeley. These 50 couples had been together 30 years. They all started out in love, then they went through this power struggle phase where they had to fight out, you know, how do you raise the children? You see the Hatfields raise them one way, the McCoy's raise them another way. And everybody thinks their way is the right way. My family wrote a present on Christmas Eve, we opened a fast, we didn't say the paper. <laughs> in her family, you gotta watch while everybody opens their presents. <laughs> There's all these sexual rules. You know, the, the couple I worked with where the guy comes out of his family where nobody ever said a word. You didn't dare. It was your privates and are you decent? And, and the girl comes out of a family where they talked openly about sex. Openly about sex. They were virgins when they got married, so they're on their wedding night. And he's, you know, he's all tight and in his no talk rule about sex and she's talking away. <laughs> and at one point she said, oh honey, touch my puka. <laughs> well, he didn't know what a puka was. <laughs> and he wouldn't dare ask her. <laughs> so he touched something that was wrong. <laughs> now that's all got to get worked out. It takes 10 years to work that out. Realistic expectations. Realistic. And then there's another 10 year period where you own your projections. You quit, quit your projecting on the other partner. How many of you had this course in high school where you were taught these stages of a healthy relationship? That was probably going to take 20 years to get to intimacy. 
And that it's hard work. Love is hard work. Not this romantic thing that if you love each other, we can make it, baby. <laughs> I don't have a job, but don't worry. <laughs> Next time you hear that, get out fast. <laughs> so value yourselves. You've done the best you knew how to do. You've done the best. There's not one of us that wanted to go from this love and this idyllic place to a divorce court. There's not one person that wanted that to happen. But it happens. It happens because most people haven't got the tools. Uh, the I is isolation. You're going to experience isolation. You're going to experience a low-grade depression. Because that's what grief is. It's loss. You're dealing with loss. There'll be a loneliness here. It will bring all your terrors of abandonment. So a kind of a voltage, a new kind of voltage will come on about your emotions. An emotional voltage where you're going to start feeling the feelings. You'll feel anger more intensely. Because that's part of the grief process. And you know, you, you, you go into things, uh, you have lawyers dealing with your stuff, and there's laws in different states, and, uh, and there's, there's a lot of things that people can legitimately be angry about. And, and so anger is going to be there. You, you may just be angry because it's happening. Because your life is being so disrupted. It's important to connect with the feelings. See, remember, emotions are part of our personal power. If we don't have our emotions, we don't have our personal power. So this emotional voltage is a crucial part of surviving. Later on, I'm going to talk about some grave dangers in divorcing, and one of them is people who do anything to get out of this emotion. Do anything to mood alter, get out of the emotion. I'm going to tell you that if you want to survive a divorce well, you've got to stay in the pain. You've got to stay with the feel of feelings. You've got to stay with the anger. That may be real important for women more than men sometimes. Well, women do not have as much permission for anger as men do. See, men, men do not have permission for sadness. And, and, and there's going to be sadness. There's going to be remorse. It, it's a... a Pete and I were talking today about men crying. I have a shared group of men where we cry with each other. It's one of the most healing things that's ever been in my life. To be able to talk to these guys, and if I'm, in that, if I'm there, I express it. And I have guys that come up, put their arms around me. You know, guys that play football, and uh, you know, that are real men. So, so this emotional voltage. Now, one of the things that will really come out is fear of the, and, 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 a, and a kind of an anxiety. Expect that if you're going through a divorce, there's going to be anxiety. 